Good afternoon and welcome to Ely Cathedral for this service of Choral Evensong, the first Evensong of the Feast of the Annunciation. We're very glad to welcome the choir of Holy Trinity South Church and their supporters. The choir has been singing the services for us in the absence of our cathedral choir this weekend. We thank them very much indeed for their contributions to our worship. Service begins on page two of the order of service and continues without further announcement. Since by man came death, by man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive.
The first lesson is taken from the Book of Wisdom, the ninth chapter, beginning to read at the first verse. O God of my ancestors and Lord of mercy, who have made all things by your word and by your wisdom have formed humankind to have dominion over the creatures you have made and rule the world in holiness and righteousness and pronounce judgment in uprightness of soul. Give me the wisdom that sits by your throne and do not reject me from among your servants. For I am your servant, the son of your servant girl, a man who is weak and short-lived, with little understanding of judgment and laws, for even one who is perfect among human beings will be regarded as nothing without the wisdom that comes from you. You have chosen me to be king of your people and to be judge over your sons and daughters. You have given command to build a temple on your holy mountain and an altar in the city of your habitation, a copy of the holy tent that you prepared from the beginning. With you is wisdom. She who knows your works and was present when you made the world. She understands what is pleasing in your sight and what is right according to your commandments. Send her forth from the holy heavens and from the throne of your glory, send her, that she may labor at my side and that I may learn what is pleasing to you. For she knows <coughs> and understands all things, and she will guide me wisely in my actions <coughs> and guard me with her glory. Then my works will be acceptable, <coughs> and I shall judge your people justly and shall be worthy of the throne of my Father. Here endeth the lesson.
The second lesson is written in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, the fourth chapter beginning at the first verse. My point is this, heirs, as long as they are minors, are no better than slaves, though they are the owners of all the property. But they remain under guardians and trustees until the date set by the father. So with us, while we were minors, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. Here endeth the lesson. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Mm. 
let us pray. Show thy mercy upon us. O Lord, save the King. you thy ministers with righteousness. Give peace in our time, O Lord. Because there is no comfort that fight and fall us, but O God, make clean our hearts within us. Beseech thee, O Lord, for thy grace into our hearts, that, as we have known the incarnation of thy Son, Jesus Christ, by the message of an angel, so by his cross and passion we may be brought into the glory of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires all good counsels and all just works do proceed. Give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, 
and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. (laughs) 
As Canon James told us at the start of the service, we are tonight keeping the first evensong of the Feast of the Annunciation. This normally occurs on March the 25th, but has to be transferred to after Easter when the official date coincides with Holy Week, as it did this year and does in about a quarter of all years. That suggests that March the 25th might have been a badly chosen day. But of course it was chosen very early in the history of the church and was selected because the Annunciation recalls the occasion when Mary said yes to God, or more specifically to his messenger, the Archangel Gabriel, and agreed to become the person through whom the Messiah would become God incarnate. And March the 25th is precisely nine months before Christmas Day. Because in the mind of people in the early modern period, Mary's pregnancy would of course have been perfect in every way, including its length. Subsequently, many artists have been inspired by the Annunciation, almost all depicting Mary offering willing and demure submission to the will of God, thereby becoming the God-bearer. And then, about 2,000 years after the original event, along comes David Wynne. There will probably be a wry smile on the face of those who are members of the regular congregation, but I know we have a visiting choir with supporters, and the name David Wynne will need some explanation. He was the sculptor of the statue of Mary that stands above the altar in the Lady Chapel of this cathedral. And if you've not seen it, you ought to go and look. It is a very striking statue, erected around the millennium, invoking strong responses among those who are looking at it for the first time frequently of dislike. And that dislike does not always dissipate with familiarity or the passage of time. The spiel about it that I give as a tour guide, which I believe is basically true even if slightly coloured for the purposes of entertaining our visitors, is that after the statue was installed, even the dean and chapter of the day were somewhat taken aback they had anticipated something along the lines of the other Wynne artwork in this building, which depicts the encounter between Mary Magdalene and the risen Christ in the garden immediately after the resurrection. It's in the south, choir, the south transept, and both the effigies are attenuated figures in bronze. What the dean and chapter got in the lady chapel was a figure that was substantially larger than life, heavily built and brightly coloured. Did you notice that in tonight's first reading from the Wisdom of Solomon, that wisdom, given human qualities by the writer, is treated as female? Why? Well, of course, we don't know why. But I can't help feeling that in the centuries of male domination, it may have been because wisdom 
is supposed to appeal to men. And in those days, it was not supposed to appeal to women. And something that appeals to men must, of course, be feminine. Or is it possible that women really are wise? Indeed, that passage from Wisdom goes even further because the description of the functions of wisdom in the past time of creation, indeed in existence out of time, <coughs> draws very close parallels with equating wisdom and the Holy Spirit, and yet still uses female pronouns. In contrast, the chronologically later passage from Galatians that was the second lesson wholeheartedly grasps the idea that human wisdom will evolve over time but assumes a totally masculine world leading to a triumphal conclusion that because of the intervention of the eternal God in human form into our world confined by time, we can claim to be God's son. Sons? That's what it says. It does not use the genderless term children. Yet it is a much later writing than that of wisdom. I wonder, might there have been a brief flash of realization, in, realization centuries ago that women and men are equal? A realization that, that occurred when wisdom was being written and it had been forgotten for about 25 or so centuries since. We cannot tell. Now, however, the realization has redawned, as it were. And I believe that the message of Our Lady Chapel statue, whatever we think of it in terms of artistic merit, makes a very important point in no way incompatible with the traditional biblical picture of the Annunciation. Mary heard through the archangel what God wanted of her. And despite being understandably startled, the request was, let's face it, absolutely unique in history, so she would have been entitled to be startled, she agreed. This, for the centuries when women were regarded as inferior to men, was depicted as demure acceptance of instructions, typifying womanly behavior i.e. that a woman should act in obedience to her husband, to men in general, and certainly to God, who was, of course, male. And now we think we understand that men were wrong and women were equal all the time. Since that dawn, things have actually moved in historical terms very quickly even if not fast enough for some. I remember, as a married man in my 20s, so not as a youngster, a very tiny youngster anyway, being completely startled when I got onto a bus for the first time being driven by a woman. I got on, somehow expecting her to crash it before she got to the town centre. She didn't. And since then, we have had three prime ministers that have been women, a woman chairing our Supreme Court, a woman as General Secretary to the TUC, several women in the chairship, chairmanships of public companies, or chairs, I shouldn't have said manships, should I? And of course, not a few bishops. So things have changed. Mary accepted God's role for her because it involved the one thing that time has not and cannot change, and to which men can never aspire, it involved womanhood and, more importantly, motherhood. The incarnate son would need a mother. Mary accepted that role. Hail Mary, full of grace, but also of faith and strength of character that remains unequaled and full too 
of obedience to the divine will, which is an example to everybody, men and women alike. Amen. Let us pray. O Christ, our incarnate God, whose virgin mother was blessed in bearing thee, but still more blessed in keeping thy word, grant us who honor the exaltation of her lowliness to follow the example of her devotion to thy will, who livest and reignest with the Father and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. From the community of the congregation, prayers have been asked today for Sue, Andrew, Alan, and Erica in their need. To remember Anne Mortimer on the anniversary of her death, and all who are in pain or bearing loss. And to those prayers we bring before God all who have asked for our prayers and all whom we would remember. We humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succour all them who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Help us to minister to them thy strength and consolation, and so endow us with the grace of sympathy and compassion that we may bring to them both help and healing. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for the nations of the world and for those who lead them. O almighty and merciful God, Father of us all, who in thy holy word has taught us that the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of thy Son, send thy blessing, we beseech thee, upon the rulers and governors of the peoples, and especially on those who are seeking to kindle the desire for righteousness and peace among the nations of the earth. Guide their counsels with the light of thy Holy Spirit of truth and wisdom, so that all their work may glorify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We give thanks and pray for God's holy church in all its expressions and all denominations. We give thanks for all who confess faith in the risen Christ. And we pray for one another. Abide with us, O Lord, for it is toward evening and the day is far spent. Abide with us and with thy whole church. Abide with us in the evening of the day, in the evening of life, in the evening of the world. Abide with us in thy grace and mercy, in holy word and sacrament, in thy comfort and thy blessing. Abide with us in the night of distress and fear, in the night of doubt and temptation, in the night of death. Abide with us and with all thy faithful ones, O Lord, in time and in eternity. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray for ourselves and our journey with God. Faithful God, your light is the only light we need as we travel through life's mystery. Your word is the only voice we hear, that still, small voice that leads us to the place where we should be. Your presence is the only company we need as we walk this narrow road. 
your fellowship the warmth we crave to help us on our way. Grant us then wisdom to know what we must do, the will to want to do it, the courage to undertake it, the perseverance to continue in it, and the strength to complete it. This we pray in the name of Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. We join these and all our prayers with those of Our Lady, of St. Ethelreda, and all the saints, as we commend ourselves and all for whom we have prayed to God's mercy and protection. And say together, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all evermore. Amen. Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs> 